Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Deborah Palmer and I'm facilitating tonight's session on behalf of the Department for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development, Communications and the Arts. I'll call it the Department from now on, given how long the title is. And thank you for coming along tonight and for giving us um, an hour and a half of your time to talk through some of the key proposals that are being uh, uh, presented as part of the Western Sydney International Nancy Bird Wilton Flight Path proposals. Um, the, flight, the preliminary flight paths for Western Sydney International were released in June of 2023 and the draft environmental impact statement for the preliminary flight paths, including the draft noise insulation and property acquisition policy, was on public exhibition between the 24th of October 2023 and the 31st of January 2024. The submissions that we received um, during that period are now being assessed by the department and by WSP and are being considered in the finalisation of the environmental impact statement. In response to the submissions, the department is consulting now on impacted communities on two flight paths, proposals for nighttime procedures associated with reciprocal runway operations, or we're gonna call them RRO tonight, but we'll um, reiterate that a bit later. So they're around revised flight paths for jets traveling east from Western Sydney International, and then also to a new noise abatement procedure as well. And we'll be going through that in a lot of detail tonight. The consultation around those two proposals is happening through August. And tonight is an opportunity to orientate you to those proposals and to be able to answer as many questions as we can in tonight's session as well. We are recording tonight's session and the purpose of doing that recording is so that we can make the recording available on the department's website on the wissyflightpaths.com.au website um, within the week. And we've turned off everybody's cameras except for those panellists that are presenting in tonight's session as well, just for, to respect your privacy. If we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting across many different Aboriginal lands tonight and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging of all the different lands that we are meeting on and I'd also like to extend my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us in tonight's session as well. Thank you for going to the next slide. So in a moment, I'll run through the agenda, but I would just like to acknowledge the team that is with me here tonight. So David Jansen, who's the Assistant Secretary of the Western Sydney Airport Regulatory Policy Branch from the department is joining us tonight. Thanks. Hi, David. How are you? Yeah, good, Deb. How are you? Well, thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, Matt Shepherd, who's from 270, is the airspace designer. Hi, Matt. Good evening. Nice to hear you all. Terrific, thank you. And then also to we have Annette Dipmar, who's the Senior Advisor for Community Engagement with the Western Sydney International Airport Program at um, Air Services Australia. Hello. And um, also her colleague, Dave, Daniel um, Jackson, who's also from Air Services Australia as well. Daniel. Hello, everybody. And also my colleague, Paula Bradshaw, who's the Environmental Impact Statement Lead from WSP. Hi, Paula. Good evening, thanks. And also joining um, us online is uh, colleagues Anna and Daniel from the department who will be helping to answer some of the questions that are coming through in the question and answer sessions as well. Um, so in terms of tonight's agenda, what we wanted to do is to walk you through the flight path proposals, those two flight path proposals that I mentioned previously. Then we're going to pause and have, take some questions. Um, we're then going to talk through the environmental impact statement and then some questions will come through again there as well. And then we'll be looking at consultation on the proposals, what we're doing and how we're trying to outreach as many people as we possibly can in the session. So um, I'll, I'll be leading you through that and then we'll be taking some more questions as well. So in terms of uh, submitting your questions in tonight's session, if we go to the next slide, thank you. There were a number of um, questions that actually came through prior to tonight's session, and I'll be walking, walking you through the key themes for that in just a moment. But if you'd like to ask a question in tonight's session, if you'd like to pop that into the Q&A box. So that's the uh, the... On your screen here, you'll see there's a Q&A function. If you pop your question in there, the team here will be able to see that. We're going to try and respond to as many questions as we can in the session, both in writing and verbally. Um, but it is a large session. There's a large number of people in uh, tonight's session. So we might not be able to get to your question exactly, but we will be trying to summarise and theme up as many questions as we can in tonight's session. 
We are also undertaking to provide a summary of all the question themes um, from tonight's session as well. And that will be going up onto the WISI Flight Paths website as well. So um, we'll be endeavouring to get that up there as soon as we possibly can. Okay, the next slide, please. Thank you. So a number of you submitted questions prior to tonight's session, and thank you so much for doing that. That's incredibly helpful for us. Um, so the questions talked about um, the proposals, and as I mentioned, um, Matt will be going through that in a little bit more detail just to um, address what the key proposals are in this phase of consultation. A number of you also asked the questions around the flight path impact. So what is the impact of the flight paths over specific locations and why do flight paths go over or near a certain location? So just a reminder, there is a tool that we have available that's online, uh, which allows you to pop in your address and you're able to see the flight path proposals um, for the flight paths that were talked about in the draft environmental impact statement. Um, these new proposals that we're talking about um, don't have that ability on the tool, but there is a brochure that's available online as well, which does talk to the flight paths. And again, we'll be able to um, talk you to where to where to find that. We might even pop um, uh, that up at the end of the session as well. We also had a lot of questions around the noise insulation and property acquisition policy, which was um, also part of the consultation that was undertaken during the draft EIS process. Um, as well. And then also a number of questions around the environmental impacts. So again, those were detailed in the draft environmental impact assessment, but we will be able to give a short update in this session as well. Uh, questions also around aircraft noise impacts, which we'll be able to speak to in tonight's um, session. And then a number of questions around 24-7 operations. So the proposal at the moment is that, the, uh, is that it will be a 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week operating airport as well. Uh, questions around transport links to the airport were also a key theme of the uh, questions that we heard and also questions around the planning rules and the planning process as well. So we're going to talk to some of those questions in tonight's session as well. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the, the flight paths tool that's available on the website as well. So if you go to the wissyflightpaths.gov.au site, you are able to Pop in your address there and be able to um, uh, find out the flight paths near you. But as I mentioned, it does not cover the flight paths and the proposals that we're talking about this evening. But there is a brochure that does outline this and you'll be able to find that detail online as well. Alternatively, we do recommend that if you'd like to come along to one of our in-person community information and feedback sessions over the coming weeks, we really encourage you to do that as well or to reach out to us via our 1800 number or email address and I'll provide those details towards the end of tonight's session. So I'd now like to hand over to Matt Shepherd from 270, who's going to talk us through the flight path proposals. Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks, Deborah, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to come and talk about uh, the way we have been working through the, um, the feedback received from the draft EIS. And I guess I'd like to begin by saying that everything I'm talking about here tonight is contained within the brochures which are uh, available on the department's website. Um, in, in terms of how our process has operated, feedback from the draft EIS has been received uh, through the department and that information and uh, suggestions, recommendations, uh, people's concerns have been uh, consolidated into a working list which has been provided through to the design team. The design team's focus was looking at those elements of uh, responses received, submissions from the draft EIS that dealt directly with flight path uh, and noise abatement procedures primarily. So where the flight paths were located, how they were located, and also how air traffic control would operate those, uh, those uh, flight paths and the runway modes that they would select when they operated. So we've taken that information from the community and it was brought together to the design team to review. And in doing that, the design team has had to follow and stay consistent with our mandate, which was to operate within a set of guideline design principles that were developed very early in the design process and were put in place in response to the earlier environmental impact assessment that was conducted uh, in 2015, 2016. So during that EIS process, a number of design principles were recommended and required to be followed for the development of uh, 
the flight paths for Western Sydney. I won't go through all of these. They're on the screen here. Most of them are very self-evident, but I do want to reinforce always that safety is a non-negotiable number one priority for us. So when we look at where flight paths are currently positioned, where we intend to position them, and what our options are for moving them around, we are constrained within, firstly, safety as a non-negotiable number one priority. And then, of course, we have to do things which are physically possible for the aircraft to fly, which is another very consistent and strong guideline for us in terms of our practical implementation of these flight paths. Other conditions that I would like to call out here is that noise mitigation measures will be developed. Those noise mitigation measures uh, I'll discuss later on in more detail, but we'll be calling them noise abatement procedures primarily for the purposes of this conversation. And those noise abatement procedures that we will be adopting uh, and, and moving forward with as a recommendation and proposal, I'll try to discuss with you um, Slowly, I'll take time to explain the way we expect air traffic control to operate them and what we hope that impact to be for the broader community. Other key design principles for us is to uh, minimize overflight of residential areas wherever possible. So from the very beginning of this project, the first thing we plotted onto our design uh, template tools was all of the known existing and expected development residential and other community-sensitive, uh, visually-sensitive, noise-sensitive locations. So we started off with a baseline of understanding what was underneath our flight paths and doing the very best we could to minimize that overflight. What this means is that the design that was presented in the draft EIS had worked very hard over a number of years to minimize overflight over residential areas. So the opportunity for us to find areas of even less residential density is quite a challenge in terms of this outcome, but we believe what we have been able to develop and what I'll discuss with you shortly has done, uh, has gone the next step to start to bring in an even more uh, noise sensitive and uh, understanding design. The other element which is quite salient to our discussion here is the uh, concept that procedures need to be developed uh, for night operations, recognizing that nighttime operations have a greater impact on the community. Um, and we need to do that within the, the scope of not constraining airport operations. So Western Sydney Airport has been built and is expected to operate 24 hours. And so we need to put in place procedures which we can do to minimize the impact of that nighttime operation on the communities that live around that airport site. So these principles really have been shaped to govern what the initial draft EIS uh, flight paths were that were presented earlier this year. And uh, have also shaped our incremental uh, proposals that we're now bringing forward. Uh, next slide, please. So very germane to how we operate this um, design is the runway modes of operation. So what we are bringing to you are two proposed changes, which are runway mode dependent. So I'm sure um, if you're online here today and you're interested in the airport, you're already aware that we are proposing five runway modes of operation. During daytime, we will have runway 05 or runway 23. In these runway modes, 05 or 23, the aircraft always arrive and take off heading in the same direction. This is standard aircraft operating procedure. It's the way that most airports operate all the time around the world. And the purpose of this is to ensure that aircraft are taking off uh, with a headwind in operation, which then minimizes the, uh, the time the aircraft are on the runway. Uh, it also improves the performance of the aircraft, which means they climb more quickly and descend more slowly, which means that it minimizes the noise uh, of aircraft operations wherever possible. At nighttime, we will have three modes of operation, and these include different flight paths to our day modes. So at night, we will primarily expect to operate reciprocal runway operations at which we believe will be available for operation 78% of the time based on prevailing weather conditions as we have uh, studied them over the last um, 10 years. When reciprocal runway operations are not able to be operated, then the airport would switch to either using a nighttime runway 05 or a nighttime runway 23 mode. So we have five different modes of operation the changes we are proposing uh, and that we are discussing tonight 
uh, pertain primarily or in fact entirely to those nighttime operations. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about reciprocal runway operations, RRO. RRO is a way of operating the airport where instead of the aircraft operating in the same direction for arrivals and departures, they will operate in an opposite direction. The design uh, for RRO for Western Sydney has aircraft arriving from the south coming into land and departing in a southerly direction when the aircraft are departing. This means that the aircraft are operating nose to nose. And what that means is that air traffic control must space these aircraft much further apart than they do in normal operations. The safety of this operation means that um, air traffic control will find much more complexity in managing aircraft that are pointing towards each other rather than aircraft that are traveling in the same direction, um, much the same way it would be if you were trying to drive the opposite direction down a highway. So because it involves nose to nose flight paths, and because it's um, requiring traffic demand and complexity in its appreciation, there are limitations to the number of aircraft that we expect to air traffic control to be able to accommodate in RRO mode. The number nominally is around 20 aircraft per hour in RRO, but this still remains to be tested. Western Sydney is a new airport. We do not yet have aircraft operating to and from the airport. And what that means is that the schedules we are using to assess what aircraft types will fly in and out of the airport is still up for conjecture and is still being developed. However, I would like to say Western Sydney Airport has worked very hard to develop up uh, the uh, expected schedules and they have put a lot of energy and time into studying the market, studying the expectation. And we believe that we have got a sound basis to be used in terms of planning for this operation and for understanding the impact of the operation. So when it is safe to do so and the weather conditions enable it, we will operate reciprocal runway operations. The wind requirement is no more than five knots of tailwind on a departing aircraft or an arriving aircraft. This is an international standard. It is one that's endorsed by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority in Australia. Uh, the airline operators all are comfortable with the use of no more than five knots tailwind for operation, and it is considered a safe mode of operating globally. So in, when the wind enables us to operate it, we can go to RRO, but there is also another condition. We need to have a dry runway. And the reason for this is if the runway is wet, we have reduced braking capacity for the aircraft on the runway. And this means that aircraft will take longer to land, potentially longer to take off, and it can put aircraft in an unsafe situation where there is reduced braking capability. So when the wind enables us and the precipitation enables us, and air traffic control complexity is enabling it, we believe that reciprocal runway operations could be operated up to approximately 78% of any given night. Uh, this doesn't mean that it's 78% of every night. It means that 78% of the time at night, we believe we could be in RRO. Uh, next slide, please, Oscar. So the image that I have on the screen here is the image that you would see in the Western Sydney noise tool, which is available on the Department of Infrastructure site at wsiflypass.com. The, um, the purple tracks are the departing flight paths and the yellow tracks are the arriving flight paths. The, as you'll see, the colors start to fade out as the aircraft get further from the airport and that's been put in there to indicate generally the altitude of the aircraft. These are always nominal tracks that we display uh, when we talk about aircraft flight paths because we understand that aircraft will deviate from these tracks when there is weather or when other conditions are required, such as safe separation of aircraft. However, these are the tracks that we would expect most of the time for aircraft to operate on. So arriving aircraft from the north come down that yellow line, which is very pale at the top of the screen, and descend down in heading towards Wallachia and then turn off uh, as they cross the Great Western Highway and head out to track what we call downwind, flying parallel with the airport runway before they turn final south of Lake Baragarang to uh, come into land. Arriving aircraft from the west will come straight in and track direct to join that final position at around 14 miles from touchdown and aircraft coming from the east track in down over their Royal National Park before joining their base leg. 
We put the arriving aircraft on a long final, which enables us to have a stable, long planned model for air traffic control to understand the exact speed and location of the aircraft. And then the reciprocal runway design has the departing aircraft turning as soon as possible off the runway, which enables them to get clear of the arriving aircraft as quickly as possible and enable uh, efficient operations and for us to use RRO as much as possible. The, um, the early right turn also means that the aircraft are crossing the arriving traffic when they turn right and head up to the north towards Linden or turn left and head to the south down towards Picton. Those aircraft are turning quickly away and being able to climb without restriction to higher operating altitudes, which serves to minimize any, um, well, minimize the noise impact coming from the operation if we had to keep our departing airplanes lower. So when a tower controller is working at Western Sydney Airport and they are preparing to depart an aircraft, let's say, for example, an airplane is departing to the right to head towards Brisbane, that would be an early right turn off the runway. The tower controller has to look at the arriving airplanes and understand whether or not there is space for the airplane to depart. Generally, the uh, air traffic controller will follow the rule set which is available to them, which says that as long as the arriving aircraft is more than 10 miles from touchdown, that means basically not on a straight in approach in our design here, they can clear their departing aeroplane to take off and turn right and head towards Brisbane. If the aircraft is inside 10 miles, there isn't space for the departing aircraft to make the turn safely clear of the arriving, and so they would have to hold the departing aircraft on the runway until the arriving aircraft is safely on the ground and clear of the runway before they can depart. So there is a standard spacing, which means that arriving aircraft should be approximately 10 miles or on a downwind leg before a departing aircraft can depart. If the arriving aircraft is closer than 10 miles, then it's not available to depart. So this starts to impact on the operation of Western Sydney Airport. So key features of our reciprocal runway operation are that departing aircraft flying on the purple tracks will turn early from the runway heading to either track to the north, west, or to the south. And arrivals will fill, file a uh, long straight in approach to land. And this is the mode that we would expect to operate approximately 78% of the time at night between the hours of 11 p.m. and 5.30 a.m. Next slide, please. So our proposals both relate to that reciprocal runway operation mode. The first proposal, as Deborah mentioned, was a change to the flight paths for jet aircraft traveling east from Western Sydney during RRO. The second one is not a change to flight paths specifically, although it does have that outcome, but it is a change to the way air traffic control operate the runways and position the aircraft. And because it's this particular type of change, it's called a change to noise abatement procedures. So I'll speak about proposal two shortly, um, but let's stick to proposal one at the moment, which operates specifically at nighttime RRO. Next slide, please, Oscar. So I have the same image on the screen that I showed you earlier, which comes from the draft EIS. So this is what is currently before the community. And we are talking about a proposal to change this. So in the model that we have here, the aircraft depart to the north, uh, and then those that are proceeding to North America, Fiji, uh, Norfolk Island, and other locations that are in the North Pacific and North America, they make a right turn up towards Linden and then continue that right turn and head out to the east. Next slide, please. Our proposal is to take those aircraft and reallocate them to a new runway, oh, sorry, a new flight path, or I shouldn't say new, it's an existing flight path in the proposal. Our intention is to take those uh, jet aircraft that were going to turn right and head up to the north, and we'll now turn them left off runway 23, head to the south down towards Picton, and then turn and track out to the east. This flight path was positioned, the south one that we are now talking about, was chosen as the standard route for aircraft tracking to the South Pacific, such as New Zealand and South America. Uh, and that flight path would now take the aircraft going to North America as well. 
Our studies indicate that there is a limited change in the track miles, but we are able to reposition aircraft from flying over communities in Silverdale, Wallachia, and uh, the Linden area and Falkenbridge. Um, therefore, it makes sense to make that switch to position those aircraft onto the southern eastern track instead. It's important to note, though, that this is for jet aircraft and non-jet aircraft will still continue to track on that right turn if they are heading up to Newcastle, Kempsey, Port Macquarie, Tari, Coffs Harbour, et cetera, uh, or even up towards Brisbane, those non-jet aircraft would track up that way. I'd make it very clear that it's non-jet aircraft, but I also want to stress that at the moment, there is not an expectation of very many non-jet aircraft operating at Western Sydney Airport. So the, the count for this flight number is very low, and we expect there to be minimal operations on that track initially. So that's the first proposal that we're talking about, the switch of jet aircraft heading to North America uh, and Fiji, et cetera, will now be turning left instead of right. And this proposal will operate whenever we operate RRO. So the non-jet, sorry, the jet SID that we had, which headed off to the Northeast will no longer be in operation at any RRO mode. Next slide, please. So the next proposal I'm going to talk through is specifically related to the noise abatement procedures for Western Sydney. So noise abatement procedures are procedures which are developed by both the airport and air traffic control in consultation with the airline operators and the community with the purpose of minimizing aircraft overflight noise. Um, they don't relate just to airborne operations either. They can relate to on-ground operations. So at almost every airport in Australia, there are noise abatement procedures in place which state how aircraft should be operated, um, how much noise they can make when on the, on the ground, where they should make that noise when, on, when they're on the ground, uh, and how they should uh, operate the aircraft in general. So noise abatement procedures provide guidance to pilots and air traffic controls on which runways should be used to minimize the noise to have the effect of noise on the community and which flight paths air traffic controls should select to put aircraft on to minimize the noise. And it also provides guidance to pilots on aircraft operating procedures, such as flap deployment and thrust settings. Now, where this comes into effect, so I'll just talk through flap deployment for a moment. When an aircraft is coming in to land, the aircraft flies in in its most efficient manner possible. And as long as the aircraft is flying in with no changes to its structure, the aircraft will make the minimum noise. As aircraft get closer to the field, they start to deploy their flaps, which is a, a thing used by aircraft to change the speed of their final approach. When a flap is deployed um, or when speed brakes are deployed or when the gear of an aircraft is deployed down, that increases the noise that the airframe makes and increases the noise experienced by the communities underneath. So where it is safe to do so, uh, it's possible to work with the pilots operating the aircraft and the airlines to change the, uh, or to make sure that these deployments of flaps uh, and uh, lowering of undercarriage are done at the time when they are required and minimizing early deployment of these when it's not necessary, therefore minimizing noise over the community. When we look at departing aircraft, uh, taking off to climb, they also use flap deployment and they also have thrust settings. Uh, the amount of thrust that an aircraft puts out obviously increases the noise as the engines run faster and louder. Um, so we can work with airlines to change their noise abatement departure procedures. And these noise abatement departure procedures actually ask pilots to change their flap deployment and the level of thrust they use to change the noise of the community on depart, sorry, the noise over the community on departure as well. So noise abatement procedures not only deal with the airborne operation, but they also deal with the on-ground operation. We can ask an airline and, and pilots flying into Western Sydney to minimize the use of reverse thrust when they're landing, which minimizes the noise that the aircraft makes when it touches down on the runway. So all of these things are in uh, discussion at the moment uh, in development of the uh, noise abatement procedures for Western Sydney Airport. 
Uh, there are examples of these and some basic expectation already in the draft EIS. These will be further developed during the final EIS and will continue to be developed by air services uh, in the development through the detailed design to operation of Western Sydney Airport. And this is an ongoing uh, uh, process which continues at all of the major airports in Australia. Noise abatement procedures are regularly reviewed. So next slide, please. The, um, the proposal we're talking about is a proposal to change the noise abatement procedures at Western Sydney. And it's a specifically uh, focused on a change to the way that reciprocal runway operations is intended to run. Next slide, please. So here we are now showing you the proposal for the operation of reciprocal runway operations, including our proposal one. So the image you see on the screen here is the last one that I showed you, uh, where we have taken the jet aircraft that depart to the Northeast, and we have switched them down to depart on that Southeastern track. So this is how we expect the operations to be as a baseline. Our proposal two then, next slide please, is to change those noise abatement procedures, I'm sorry, to change the way the aircraft are operated by enabling air traffic control to, when traffic permits, change the operation for aircraft heading to the west and the north to leave the aircraft on runway center line for longer before they turn on that west or northwest track. This delaying of the turn to the right will minimize the overflight of Wallachia and Silverdale, and be, or I should say North Silverdale. And by positioning those aircraft further out to the Southwest before they turn, we can also then turn the aircraft in a right turn and keep them broadly west of Katoomba before they head up north towards uh, Brisbane, uh, the Gold Coast and other Northern ports, including Asia. You'll see on the display here in front of you that we have a heavy purple line which follows runway center line as it departs from Western Sydney Airport and then turns to the right and tracks out to the west and the northwest. You'll also see that there is a shaded line which uh, is a lighter pink purple color. That is a more representative example of how the aircraft will actually operate because this procedure is not a, an agreed published track. This is a procedure that air traffic control will do by actually radar vectoring the aircraft on runway heading and then turning the aircraft right when they're able to do so. And the reason why we keep this flexible is because air traffic control will need to maintain separation between that departing airplane and other arriving aircraft, which will continue to come into the airport. When the... Um, this procedure will be operated when it's safe to do so. And what that means is that when the traffic levels enable air traffic control to manage this, they will be able to operate in this procedure. When they are not able to follow this procedure, they will revert back to using the existing RRO operations that you saw on the previous slide. So the way, and the reason why this is a flexible arrangement is because when the arriving aircraft come into land, if you will recall from my earlier discussion in RRO, the arriving aircraft needs to be um, outside of 10 nautical miles, that's 20 kilometers from touchdown in order to clear that departing aircraft. When the, um, because we leave the departing aircraft on runway center line for longer in this noise abatement procedure, we extend the time interval that the aircraft are pointing nose to nose at each other which means we need to increase the spacing between the departing aeroplane and the arriving aeroplane. So previously it was 10 nautical mile spacing required. In this new mode for it to be operated, we would need to have approximately 30 nautical miles between the arriving aeroplane and the departing aeroplane. That's a three times uh, increase in the spacing that's required. So as you can see, there is some constraint to our ability to operate this mode. But our assessment of the, um, of the schedules uh, moving forward from our first performance level schedule of Western Sydney based on 2033 traffic would be that we could operate this new mode approximately 80% of the time that we are running RRO. So we do believe that there is a great deal of benefit to us in being able to bring this new flight path procedure in for operation. Uh, 
while we will be bringing this in for jet aircraft, as I mentioned earlier, we will still be leaving non-jet aircraft on that preceding SID. So as you see the dotted line running from Silverdale up towards Linden, that will still be used by non-jet aircraft that are flying out of Western Sydney at night in RR remote. So our changes are specific to jet aircraft and not non-jet aircraft. The reason for this primarily is that non-jet aircraft fly much more slowly. Uh, they don't generate as much noise. And for us to have non-jet aircraft that are heading to uh, inner locations like Port Macquarie and Tari, traveling west of Katooma before turning back towards uh, Port Macquarie and Tari as a considerable uh, track mile impost on them and will significantly increase the flight time of aircraft traveling out there. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I just noticed there's a few questions here about um, some clarifications, but if you, I'll just wait and we'll discuss these um, points a little bit further and I'm happy to come back to review some of these slides if we need to. Uh, next slide, please. So this is to give you an example of the expected impact of the changes we are bringing in. So here you can see the flight path that we're changing. Um, and uh, this is giving you an example of what the changes would look like if we were using um, reciprocal runway operations in 2033 and uh, the number of flights that we would expect to change and how that change would look like once we instigate it. So if we could have a look at Delta 28, Firstly, Oscar. So we will be taking all of the jet aircraft on that track and moving them to the southern track. So there was only one aircraft in 2033 expected to use that track. Uh, in our proposal, there would be no aircraft on that track. Delta 29, we had a um, expectation in the draft EIS that up to five aircraft a night would use that track. We now expect that there would be approximately one aircraft when RRO is operation, in operation that would use that track at night. Uh, Delta 30, we were expecting four aircraft per night nominally to be on that track. And under our proposal, the maximum could be expected up to one aircraft per night on that specific track. And then to the south on Delta 31, there is no change to that track at all. Um, uh, we, there is no modification at all to the southern one. And then the next one, please, Oscar. Thank you. Delta 32 is um, was two aircraft, and that one that was going out on Delta 28 to the northeast will now be swung down onto Delta 32, and our new proposed maximum is up to three aircraft. If we have a quick look at the summary of change in the North Silverdale, Wallachia area, we were expecting at night under RRO to have a maximum of 10, 10 aircraft depart. This number would be reduced to two aircraft. Of course, those aircraft don't just magic, magically disappear. They're being reallocated to different flight paths. So if we have a look at the new northern flight path that's uh, being proposed. Next, thank you. So departures north, we are proposing a maximum of four aircraft would be expected on that. On the western flight path, we're looking at a maximum of three aircraft on that. And in summary, we would expect um, a proposed maximum of seven aircraft to be taking that new track, which heads along runway heading and then turns out to the west and to the north remaining, uh, clear of the uh, Greater Western Highway and the residential areas of North Silverdale and Wallachia. So that's our 2033 example. If we just step to the next slide, please. To give you an idea of what the noise footprint looks like, in 2033, these footprints are showing the possible movement counts of flights generating a 60 decibel noise footprint or greater. Now, 60 decibels of noise is considered to be the industry standard at night for discussing uh, aircraft noise um, uh, implications for the community because uh, N60 is more sensitive than an N70. It uh, gives us a clearer view of what the impacts would be. And you can see that under the current draft uh, EIS out there, that we have got over the Falkenbridge Linden area, approximately between two and four aircraft would generate noise of uh, 60 decibels or greater. In the area over Wallachia, um, and in the Silverdale area, we can see there are approximately between five and nine aircraft that would generate up to 60 de decibels uh, of noise. 
Next slide, please. As we change the flight paths and move that, you can see that we have removed over Wallachia and Silverdale that nominal number uh, of uh, N60s. And uh, the same could be said for Linden and Falkenbridge. Those aircraft have been repositioned to the southwest of the airport and then over the greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area. We did some studies on our level of impact to the World Heritage Area, which is quite easy to see in this image. And we haven't increased the track miles of flights over the World Heritage. We've just moved them over some areas which have got less population growth. Um, so the next slide, we see what it would look like in 2040. So in 2040, we don't expect to be able to operate our new procedure quite as much because there will be more aircraft arriving. So this is showing the existing noise footprint where we have noise movement, uh, noise uh, numbers uh, between five and nine were expected over the um, Linden um, and Falconbridge area. And uh, we can see between 10 and 19 over Wallachia. And these are maximum movement numbers too. As you switch to see our proposal in the next slide, you can see that we have reduced the, um, the noise footprint over the Wallachia Silverdale area and also up as it crosses the Great Western Highway. So that's uh, in 2040. And then we have another slide um, coming up shortly, but I'll discuss the 2050 model. So in 2055, we know that there will be a lot more airplanes flying into Western Sydney. So as those aircraft fly in to land at Western Sydney and depart from Western Sydney at night, uh, we're now getting almost to the peak operation of the airport. It's expected to be as busy as this airport will get. Um, and so there will be some reductions in our ability to operate the new proposal. So if we run through the, uh, the expected numbers now, uh, in 2055, we thought on Delta 28, there would be up to a maximum of five aircraft. That's now been removed. On Delta 29, we had a maximum of uh, 20 expected. We expect to reduce that. So now there'll be no more than 15 as expected. Um, in Delta 30, we were expecting eight. Our proposal now brings that number down to five. Uh, if we look to the south, again, no change to Delta 31. And in Delta 32, um, we were only expecting to have three aircraft on there in RRO mode at night. And now it looks like we can have up to a maximum of eight aircraft on that track. So those aircraft that have been removed from there um, will, sorry, those uh, changes mean that our proposed maximum under this new proposal we're discussing is up to a total of 20 at nighttime going in that early right turn, uh, whereas previously it was 33 aircraft in that right turn when it was busy. So those aircraft, as previously discussed, are now reallocated to new tracks. So on the next slide, we'll see those next tracks move, the aircraft head out. On the northern track, Delta 28, we expect a maximum of five aircraft to fly that track at night in 2055. And on the western track, we expect a maximum of three aircraft and a sum total of eight aircraft on that new procedure flying down on runway heading. So that's the new track discussed. If we go to the next slide, you'll see the noise footprints. Um, so here we are in 2055. This is the expectation uh, under the draft EIS. And uh, you can see that the noise footprint there is um, N60s in the uh, Linden area of uh, 10 to 19. And over Wallachia, we see uh, 20 to 49 uh, movements generating an N60 noise footprint. In the next slide, as you move on, you'll see that those numbers have reduced slightly. Uh, we've now come down one order of magnitude over Wallachia and Silverdale, and again over the, um, the Linden and Hazelhurst area, sorry, our Falkenbridge area. Um, so these, again, are showing the N60 noise footprints um, that you would expect to see at night when RRO mode is in operation and proposals one and two have been implemented as part of the design. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pause there. Um, happy to to pick up some uh, some uh, questions from you. Terrific. Thank you, Matt, so much for that. And I know that was a lot of information for pe people to take on board. Just a reminder that this webinar will be made available on the WSI Flight Paths. Uh, website following tonight's session. It usually takes us about a week to get that up there, but we will have that available for you. Um, also a reminder too that you can actually access previous webinars that explained the draft environmental impact statement 
in more detail as well. So that's also available on the on the WYSI Flight Paths website under the resources tab on the videos section there. You'll be able to look at previous videos which explain uh, in detail how the draft environmental impact statement and indeed the flight path design process was initially put together as well. Matt, I'm going to let you take a sip of water before I ask you some questions and I'm going to go to David first. So David, just wondering if you could talk to us please about why there isn't a curfew being implemented at Western Sydney International. Yeah, thanks Deb and, and this is um, obviously a key issue we get in, in pretty much all of our public engagement um, in community and um, I suspect what will continue to be. Um, so in, in terms of our exercise here in, in terms of the Western Sydney International Flight Pass, we are subject to a document called the Western Sydney Airport Plan. And that Western Sydney Airport Plan sets out the guidance that we need to follow in, in going through the flight path process. Now, when the then government put out the Western Sydney Airport Plan, it was uh, made very clear uh, as a matter of policy that there would be no curfew at Western Sydney Airport. And so that's why we don't um, design for curfew operations at Western Sydney Airport. So it is a, a decision of government, essentially, uh, back uh, in 2016. Thanks, David. I'll stay with you. Um, a few questions here too around why isn't the noise tool being updated at this time? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And um, look, we're very proud of the, the noise tool. It's a great product. Um, that the reality was that we simply couldn't update it and then test it um, with our user community in time to actually consult with you in a way that we are. So in, in an ideal world, we would have done that. Um, uh, so at this stage, we are going out to community because we think that's, that's the most important thing to go out to community with these two flight path uh, proposals um, with the information that we have. So you can see the brochure and these presentations. And of course, please do come along to the community information and feedback sessions in person over the next two weeks. Um, we are looking also at updating the, the noise tool, but but that won't be uh, in the next two weeks. So it is it's very much on our agenda. It's just we couldn't get the timing to work uh, for this particular community consultation. Terrific. Thanks, David. Matt, I'm going to come to some questions for you. Um, one, one question that's coming through is why did you... Um, why did you have the original flight paths going over the Blue Mountains and now you're coming back with these suggestions? What, why, what's what been the driver for the change? Um, well, the driver for the change is, has been uh, the community submissions. Um, and I, I will say that when we were looking to position the flight paths over um, somewhere to get the, the jet aircraft to depart uh, as away as quickly as possible. Um, we looked for the area with the least population density uh, across the entire Blue Mountains area. Uh, and we looked uh, not, not just at the Blue Mountains as far as Katoomba and then stopped, we looked all the way out to the west. Um, in the end, we identified that Linden area as having a very low density of residents. And at that point, this was, well, that point was after a lot of discussion identified as an area where we believed we could put the aircraft through with the minimum impact to the community. Um, and to a degree that's been borne out in our discussions where while the, um, the fly parts are changing significantly, the numbers of residences that we are overflying aren't changing that much. So you can see that there are changes certainly in different localities, but when we go through and look at the, the numbers of residential areas we are overflowing with our design, there isn't a, a massive change by us moving the flight path away from Linden and positioning it further out because um, to the west of Katoomba, there are still residential areas out there that we still will be overflying. So we we believe we had uh, picked one area. Certainly the community came, has come back very strongly to tell us that their preference is not to have the flight path there and that reason why we have brought forward this new proposal. Thanks, Matt. Bit of confusion about what uh, reciprocal runway operations means and what does nose to nose mean. Can you explain that quite simply? Um, sure, sure. Um, it is it is a different way of operating, but it's not something which is outside of the norms in Australia. Um, Kingswood Smith Airport in Sydney has reciprocal runway operations. Brisbane Airport operated reciprocal runway operations until they brought on their new uh, runway up there, and they still can operate reciprocal runway when required. Um, Adelaide operates RRO and many other airports around the world. So it's a design uh, model. It's a way of operating an airport, which um, can work to minimize the noise footprint in particular areas. Um, 
uh, in reciprocal runway operations, uh, the aircraft are pointing at each other, which is why it's called nose to nose operations. Um, so the arriving aeroplanes will come in to land from the south, heading up to the north. And uh, Oscar, I don't know if you can just swing back to that slide for me to just give me a runway, uh, the RRO image. Um, so in, um, it's the little black image with RRO on it. The uh, arriving aircraft come in from the south and come in to land on the runway. And the departing aeroplanes will be on the runway pointing nose to nose directly towards the arriving aeroplane. Um, so when there is enough space between the inbound aircraft, so it's far enough away from the airport, an aeroplane can depart off pointing directly towards the arriving aeroplane. And uh, then um, once the arriving aircraft gets too close, we can't let the departing aeroplane take off pointing towards it because as I said earlier, it's a bit like having two cars on the one highway. Um, aircraft need to be lined up with runway, particularly when they're inbound to land at a comfortable distance out. At night time, we're operating approximately 10 to 14 miles out from arrival center line. And we need about that much space for the controllers to be able to plan it and for the arriving aircraft, aircraft to be safely established on its final approach path into land. Thanks, Matt. Why are the night times different for KSA and for Western Sydney International? So the flight paths for Western Sydney are constrained significantly by the flight paths in and out of uh, KSA. KSA is, is a very busy airport now, uh, Australia's busiest airport, and its flight, so the, the number of aircraft flying in and out of KSA doesn't really stop. It runs all the time up until 11 p.m. when curfew arrives. What that means is for us to be able to operate aircraft in and out of Western Sydney Airport, we need to do that and keep those aircraft clear of the KSA flight paths. Once KSA stops operating, it enables us to bring in new flight paths, such as the RRO flight paths we were talking about tonight, but also other uh, more noise sensitive um, noise respectful, if you like, for a better term, a flight pass with a better noise outcome. We can bring those in at night when KSA is not providing constraints to us by limiting where we can put the Western Sydney aeroplanes. Thanks, Matt. The, uh, the slight difference between the curfew time at KSA and the night time for Western Sydney mm. is purely because we need our Western Sydney aeroplanes established safely on their daytime flight paths when KSA begins to operate to ensure that they are uh, safely separated. That's why we put in a buffer, which requires around 30 minutes to get those aircraft into the right position. Terrific. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all the questions that are coming through the question and answer box there. We've got around sort of well, over 400 people in tonight's meeting and, and probably about that amount of questions that are coming in through the Q&A. So I'm going to try and get through as many as I can, but I will be sort of summarising some of them up as well. And the team is trying to answer some of those in writing as well during the session, through the session. But as I mentioned before, we will be putting a summary of the key themes and the questions will go onto the website with some responses to those um, in the next um little while as well. Um, also too, if you do have any comments that you'd like to make, you are welcome to make those into the Q&A function too. And all of that commentary will be captured as part of the, the feedback that we're hearing in tonight's session as well. Um, another question for you, Matt, how will you be policing the noise abatement procedures in particularly of international airlines using Western Sydney? That's a good question. Um, so noise abatement procedures are published in uh, a document which is called the AIP. And this is a document which is shared out to every commercial pilot that flies anywhere in Australia. And there are sections which are specific to Western Sydney Airport. Um, so the, um, the noise abatement procedures for Western Sydney Airport will be published in this uh, internationally standardised document. Uh, so all pilots coming to Western Sydney, particularly all commercial airlines, will be very focused on ensuring they can apply and comply with the rule set that we have in Australia. It's in exactly the same way as it's done for other airports around Australia and around the world. Um, also, noise abatement procedures are um, just as applicable for air traffic control. So air traffic control are expected to operate according to the noise abatement procedures whenever it is safe to do so, which we expect to be by design um, a very safe, comfortable procedure for ATC to operate 
in the same way they do at other major airports in Australia. So we will have air traffic control issuing clearances, which are instructions to pilots which comply with the noise abatement procedures, and the pilots will be expecting to comply with those procedures before they even arrive, and certainly before they depart from Western Sydney. Thank you, Matt. Question here, does this mean that all nighttime flights take off through southwest Sydney? It does not mean all nighttime flights. What it means is that when RRO is in operation and it's safe to do so, airplanes departing from Western Sydney will take off on that heading to the southwest of Western Sydney Airport and track down to approximately uh, eight miles south of the field. Please don't quote me on that number. It's until they get south of Silverdale and then the aircraft will start to turn around to the right to track off to the north. And our departures heading to the south and east will track off on that more southerly track that you saw described on the imagery before. Um, so while we're talking about southwest of Sydney, it will be when RRO can be operated approximately 78% of the time when the weather permits, aircraft would depart and arrive and operate to the south of Western Sydney Airport. Thank you. Could you please clarify too, if Proposal 2 can't operate due to traffic, does um, Air Services Australia revert to Proposal 1 or to the original RRO published in the draft EIS? So the um, Proposal 1 would be implemented at as becoming the new RRO. So if Proposal 2 can't be operated, we would refer to operating uh, RRO as per Proposal 1. Okay. So it, what this means in effect is that there will be no more aircraft departing to North America and Fiji at night in RRO mode in a right turn. They would be tracking to the south and then to the east. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matt. The question here too around um, the yellow track over Penrith. There's no plane symbols. What traffic is expected on the track that goes over Penrith? Okay. The, um, the track over Penrith uh, that I've shown you tonight is a yellow track. Therefore, it's an arriving track, and that would be both jet and non-jet aircraft flying into land. Terrific. Thanks, Matt. So just a reminder too that the webinar recording will go onto the department's website. You can actually access the information about the flight path proposals that are in tonight's session on the website currently. So there is a brochure that is already on the website which does explain what Matt, Matt has gone through in a bit more detail and it does include the, the maps that Matt's been speaking to as well. I'm going to pause there with the questions at the moment and pick up again on the presentation with David Jansen who will just be running through the environmental impact statement next steps and then we're going to pause again and have a few more questions before I talk about the uh, community engagement that we're undertaking through this process. Thanks David. Thanks Deb and, and look I'll be super quick uh, on this so that we can um, get as many questions in as possible so I know there's a lot of questions um, out there, but I did just want to give you a, a quick update on where we're at um, in this process and, and what the next sort of six months uh, looks like. So since the closure of our public uh, exhibition period on 31st of January, we have been reviewing the submissions, all 8,477 of them, and uh, we're now well and truly into the response um, part of that process. So we've reviewed the submissions, categorised the issues, looked at them. Uh, and now we're responding to them. And of course, that's why we're talking to you tonight about two additional flight path uh, proposals. Um, we're going to consult on those proposals throughout the rest of August and we'll get into the locations of our in-person community information and feedback sessions uh, very shortly. But we'll take all that feedback from you. We'll take some written feedback from you uh, as well, but please get in early uh, on that. And then we'll look to finalise our environmental impact statement. So that'll take us uh, in that post-August timeframe uh, a little while. And then under the EPBEC Act, so the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, what we're then required to do, so the Department uh, of Infrastructure is the proponent for this, is that we then provide the final EIS. So that's the draft plus any amendments that we've made as a result of our further consultation to the Environment Minister. Uh, and that kicks off two statutory timeframes. So within uh, 10 business days of us providing the final EIS and the Environment Minister will publish it. That's the first. And the second one, really importantly for the decision-making process here, is that the Environment Minister then has 30 days to actually consider the EIS and provide our Minister, so the Minister for Infrastructure, the Minister Catherine King, 
with the Environment Minister's advice. Now, the Environment Minister's advice will be, I recommend that you approve or not approve the flight pass as a matter of policy, or that if you do approve the flight pass, um, you consider these, these conditions and um, many environmental assessment processes end up with conditions, and indeed the 2016 one did. Um, uh, and then um, our, our minister will go and take um, her colleagues' advice um, and including any conditions, consider those, uh, consider the EIS, and then um, she will make the decision to approve or not approve the, the flight pass as a matter of, of policy. So what's our broad timing for that? So look, we're, we're hoping to get the final EIS uh, to the Environment Minister at the start of the final quarter this year. And, and then really it's, it's a matter for, for the, the ministers uh, to follow those, those timeframes where possible. It's a little bit out of the public services hands at, the, at that point. So uh, we hope we get the environment minister's advice uh, on time and, and we'll be supporting our minister obviously to make the best possible decision uh, in relation uh, to these flight paths. Just quickly, and that, that will end the, the environmental assessment process. And then we'll move into something called detailed design, which is the next stage of this process. And in detailed design, um, the, the approved flight pass will then be subject to, to further refined design work, predominantly led by Air Services uh, Australia, and then submitted to the Civil Aviation and Safety Authority for safety approval and also validation of the flight paths. Um, at this stage, uh, we are on track to um, have those flight paths ready for use for airport opening uh, towards the end of 2026. Thanks, Deb. Thanks so much, David. Um, so I'm going to go back to some questions now um, and I'll take um, questions, a number of different questions before I talk to the to the um, engagement opportunities that we have coming up over the next couple of weeks as well. Um, and we will be closing the session at 8.30, but thank you for the questions that are coming through. We'll try and work through as many as we can. Now, Matt, I'm not sure this might be a bit of a combination of you and Paula answering this one. The EIS or the draft EIS says that on average, it rains 112 days per year at Badgerys Creek. How does this accord with a 78% availability rate for RRO? I can probably start off with that and Paula, if you'd like to jump in, please feel free. But um, certainly there's been a lot of study done on the, uh, the climatology around Western Sydney Airport. Uh, the amount of fog that the airport would expect has, has driven some of the uh, navigation systems that are being implemented. Um, in relation to the precipitation, uh, we did studies to look at how often it rains, uh, in what length of period, uh, how long it rains, um, if the rain is coming more during the day than the night time. And our detailed study has shown that in the period where we're looking at RRO, our expectation is that 78% of the time, the weather would enable us to operate the RRO. Um, so while it might rain during a day, if it's not raining at night or not for a period that's very long, then we would expect the runway to dry. Recognizing also that the runways are specifically dry, designed to dry quickly. They have grooving on them as well, which uh, helps the water drain off rapidly. And so they do recover very quickly from rain when it falls. Terrific. Thanks, Matt. Um, another question for you, Matt. Will the operation of the gliders from Camden Airport be affected or limited? There will be some new nighttime controlled airspace implemented to the southwest of Western Sydney Airport uh, in the Camden area. We have worked as much as we can to minimise the impact of that new airspace uh, over Camden. I know at nighttime, which is what we've been talking about a lot, you don't see a lot of gliders up there. Uh, but during the daytime, we have tried to position our flight paths and our controlled airspace clear of Camden to enable operations at Camden to continue. Uh, the, the existing control area steps above uh, may still have some limitations on Camden, but we do still hope and expect that gliders can operate. Thanks, Matt. David, I'm going to come to a couple of questions for you. First one's around eligibility for the noise insulation. What's the radius and kilometres from the airport to be eligible for noise insulation? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Deb. The, look, the exact uh, kilometres or, or radius, in fact, is, is certainly not a circle. Um, I don't have at the, the top of my head. Um, the, the eligibility contour for the noise insulation and property acquisition program was in the draft EIS. So if you go to the draft EIS on our website and in particular the um, uh, aircraft noise uh, chapter, you, you'll see it uh, there. Um, it, it's, not a, it's not a circle in the sense that radi the noise radiates out 
sort of evenly from all parts of the airport. It's actually more of a, a longer line, and that reflects the the fact that um, jet aircraft noise in particular travels along the, the aircraft's line of travel, which is along the runway. Um, and, and you can see it there. So it extends a fair way out to the northeast um, and, and southwest, broadly following what we call the ANEC 20 contour line. Um, when we released that um, draft policy uh, last year, it was just a draft for community feedback. We got lots of community feedback on it, and we're certainly at the moment taking that um, into consideration. The final policy itself will be released with the, the final EIS a bit later on this year. Thanks, David. I'm going to stick with you as well. I guess it's a broader policy question, this one. A um, number of people have spoken about why aren't you just reviewing the Sydney Basin flight paths? Um, do you think that reviewing the Sydney Basin flight paths is a good idea? Um, well, look, um, as, a, as, a, as a public servant, I, I don't really get to have personal opinions. Um, so it's my job to um, advise the government of the day, but then to carry out that government's instructions. Uh, what I can say is that when the government looked uh, at flight paths for Western Sydney, certainly as part of that 2016 EIS, and then the Western Sydney Airport Plan, which I referenced earlier, they have made the decision that Western Sydney's flight paths can be accommodated uh, in the existing uh, Sydney Basin arrangement with minimal disturbance to other airports, and that's the direction given to us um, as it is and as is in, in the draft EIS. We, there are changes to Kingsford Smith's flight paths to accommodate Western Sydney. There are also changes to Bankstown and minor changes, as Matt has just said, to Camden and, and quite a few to also defence facilities as well, particularly RAF uh, base Richmond. So uh, at this stage, uh, Western Sydney will, will, will fit and work within the Sydney Basin but without that um, broader Sydney Basin review, which, which of course then throws open all of the flight paths for all of the airports and, and all of the affected communities. Thanks, David. This might again be a question that's a bit of Matt and Paula, not too sure. Um, there's somebody here who's talking a lot about sort of local wildlife um, that exist in areas uh, around Wallachia and Greendale, so cockatoos, parrots, eagles, etc. cetera. Um, how are you safely navigating aircraft over those specific populations of bird life and doing it safely. So have you taken into account the bird life and I guess when designing the, the flight paths? Paula, would you like to pick this one up? It's a little bit more. Sure, thanks, Matt. So, um, so we definitely assess the impacts to wildlife and biodiversity and for the um, the 2023 EIS on the website that Deb has referred to, um, the biodiversity chapter and the matters of national environmental significance chapter. So I, I direct you to that first of all, and then specific to these proposals that we're discussing tonight, we did some assessment, and you'll see this in the, the final EIS that David talked about. We found that the proposals would not result in changes to the overall biodiversity impacts as assessed in the EIS. So it's perhaps um, if you want to get um, details on specific species or specific flora and fauna, they will be detailed in those chapters. And these, just to reiterate, these proposals don't result in any changes to our overall conclusions. Thanks, Paula. Matt, another question for you. Have you taken into account the increase in population that's going to be happening in and around Western Sydney Airport? And people have talked in particular about areas including Thornton and Mayfair being built. So those sort of new um, housing developments that are occurring. Yeah, we we certainly have um, Deb. the. Um, I think from the very beginning, uh, as I said, we began by mapping out areas uh, of residential uh, density. We also took on board every piece of information we could get from the state government, state planning authorities, uh, from the federal government, and all of this information was consolidated down into um, uh, a mapping baseline, which then told us which areas we needed to avoid. So we didn't just work to avoid existing communities, 
uh, although that's clearly a priority, but we also work to avoid development and currently approved and, and expected development growth corridors. Um, so a lot of effort went into to gathering as much information as we could before we started the work, and that work has continued moving forward, uh, updating to make sure. I think um, it, it is quite a significant thing to recognise that Western Sydney is a really rapidly growing city, and um, there is a lot of activity going on there, and there is a lot of competing pressure for everything. Um, we've worked as best we can to stay clear of uh, all of the areas that we were able to identify and that process has been going on for at least eight years that I'm, I've been involved in this. Mm-hmm. Matt, what's the benefit of reciprocal runway operations to the community? Well, RRO specifically minimises overflight in certain areas. Um, so I can, I'll just give you a, an example of uh, the RRO operation at uh, KSA, so at Sydney's current international airport at night aircraft still do arrive and depart. Um, I'm not sure if everyone that's online is aware of that, but while there is a curfew, aircraft still take off and land there. Um, they There are freight flights that operate in and out, and there are also some aircraft which are approved to operate during the curfew, and of course, uh, emergency services operate in and out of, of the airport. So it continues to operate. It operates an RRO, and when it does, the aircraft arrive and depart from over uh, Botany Bay, and as a result, the noise footprint is confined to that southern side of Kings of Smith Airport. That that ex that outcome is expected for WSI for Western Sydney Airport as well. That the RRO mode that's being proposed and discussed here tonight um, will remove the noise impacts on the north side where of our Western Sydney Airport. Terrific, thanks, Matt. Another question here, does this mean that the bulk of the noise that will be impacted be felt by those people living in the Camden and the Wallandilly LGAs? The Araromo does put more noise at night over those communities. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Another question here, will non-jet operations increase in the future? The, um, the forecast for Western Sydney Airport from the very beginning in terms of who, we, who the airport expects to fly there and, and what types of aircraft they would bring uh, is has been subject to a lot of, of work to develop up an understanding and an expectation, um, but it is still only uh, an estimate of what the future operation will be like. Um, on day of opening, the airport does not expect to have uh, non-jet operations, but there is expected to be some minor growth in non-jet as it moves forward. Um, I can't give you direct figures now, but I can direct you to the draft EIS and later the final EIS do have um, a full list of the aircraft types expected to operate at the airport. Thanks, Matt. Um, David, a question for you. Why are the flight paths changing suddenly? Uh, it's it's. I don't think the the flight paths are changing suddenly. We, we've we've developed these flight paths for Western Sydney over quite a few years, and when we've put those to the community, uh, we've received a great many submissions, which we've taken very seriously, and are now going back to community with two proposals as a as a result of that. So, you know, the, the process the, the process is is what it is that we've developed those flight paths and and are now responding to community feedback uh, on them. Um, you know, and then we, we hope to move through this process and 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 uh, once the airport gets operating, they'll be, you know, continually reviewed as well. So it's, it's never entirely um, settled in stone, flight paths. There are, there are tweaks. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so I, I don't know that the, the question itself is necessarily sort of, you know, directed to what we're trying to do as part of this process, if that makes sense. Mm, thanks, David. Um, Matt, another question for you. Given the communities of Falconbridge, Linden and Woodford were identified as providing a really large number of submissions through the draft AIS process and that there was strong opposition within those submissions for all flight paths over the mid-mountains, why have you made this response um, to be only two minor, sorry, to be only two fairly minor changes that will have little impact, positive impact in the long term for the communities in the mid mountains. Um, we, in terms of reviewing the number of submissions uh, that were were provided through the um, the EIS process, as as I'm sure you'd be aware, there were a very large number of submissions received, 
And uh, as is the case in this, there are a great number of competing requests too. Um, so we um, we had a large number of aircraft, or pe sorry, a um, large number of uh, uh, people requesting a change in one direction and then competing requests for changes in different directions. Um, what we did was put the, um, the information that we had down and we looked at zones of change to ensure that if we were making a change in one location, that wasn't contradicting requests and requirements or expectations from another area. So we had to balance a lot of conflicting requirements uh, in terms of um, that were had to be looked through the lens of safety, efficiency, capacity, and environmental impact. Um, so in, in terms of doing that, we had to base on, on where the operations could be moved and when they could be moved. As I said, we had all of that criteria um, at the front to give us guidelines on how, what we could do. Um, by day, it is very difficult to move the flight paths around Western Sydney currently because of the other constraints in the airspace volume. Um, while you can go outside your house and look up and you don't see an aeroplane and you think it's quite quiet up there, um, if you hop onto Flight Radar 24, you'll note that there are a lot of aeroplanes operating in and around Sydney. And with those operations, we have uh, the commensurate you know, demands for airspace usage from defense, from existing flights operating. And in order to fit that in uh, and accommodate everything, we have been unable to find viable changes to the daytime operations. But at night, we have found some opportunity when, as the constraints have been removed for us to bring in what we think are some significant benefits for the community. Thanks, Matt. This might be a question for Annette, actually, um, but maybe Matt as well. Um, how will noise be measured in the different LGAs once the airport is in operation? So how will noise be measured once the airport is operating? Uh, so there will be um, a noise monitor strategy developed by um, us and that will be determined um, where noise monitors will be placed under the flight path. Um, that will be subject to consultation next year from our services. Um, the airport itself will have their own um, noise measures and um, around the airport itself, um, and um, they will be in contact with the community there as well. Terrific. Thanks, Annette. I'm going to pause there and just take us through the engagement opportunities that we have um, coming up over the next um, couple of weeks, just so that you are aware of those. And we really do, if we go to the next slide, thank you, really do encourage you to come along in person to any of these sessions that are coming up um, during August. So we're holding five face-to-face -face sessions and the dates and locations of those sessions are on the web are on the screen here now. So we will be in Wallachia at the Progress Hall on Wednesday evening this week between four and seven pm, heading to the Megalong Valley on the fifteenth, Warragamba Town Hall on the twenty first of August, Falcon Bridge on the twenty second of August, and then Cobbety Public School on the twenty fourth of August. So um, many of you would have received a postcard that came through your um, letterbox recently, which was notifying you of these two proposals and um, encouraging you to come along to these community information and feedback sessions. If you're able to, we really encourage you to be able to register for the sessions beforehand, but you don't need to. You can just turn up um, at these sessions on the night, but um, registering prior gives us an understanding of sort of how many people to expect on the evening and that will help us to sort of manage numbers more more wholesomely as well. So if we go to the next slide, please. Oh, and I should just say too, it's a drop-in session. So any time between um, those, sorry, if you could go back for me, thanks, um, Oscar. So any time during those sessions, so between 4 and 7 p.m., for instance, you don't have to be there for the full three hours, but that's the time that the team will be available to be able to, to meet with you and ask any questions. There's not a formal presentation at such, it's an opportunity to meet with the project team and to talk through any of your issues and feedback that you have. Similar to the photograph that's on the slide here, we will have information with the flight paths on the on the on around the room, um, and we will also be able to talk to you individually as well. As, as much as we possibly can. Thanks, Oscar, if we go to the next slide. And as I've mentioned a couple of times before, there is a brochure that's been developed, which is available on the department's website, the wissyflightpaths.gov.au 
um, website there under the resources tab that has the brochure and that details those maps that Matt has been talking about in tonight's sessions as well and also to the information posters that we have available at the community information and feedback sessions will also be on the are also available on the website currently as well so I encourage you to go to those resources to have a read through and to see if there's any additional questions that you have if we go to the next slide thank you Matt Oh, sorry, not Matt, it's Oscar driving for me, thank you. Um, in terms of feedback, there's no formal submission process like there was during the draft EIS process, but we do encourage people to come along to a community information and feedback session to be able to give your feedback. Um, we also are also accepting written feedback as well, and that can be sent through to the WISI flight paths at infrastructure.gov.au email address as well. And we will be considering all of the feedback that we hear through the community information and feedback sessions and tonight's online webinar in terms of the comments that have come through and the questions that have come through in the webinar and tonight's session as well. And we'll be using that to review the proposals for inclusion in the final EIS. And we will be endeavouring to consider all written feedback that comes through as well um, in the coming weeks as well. So do encourage you to, to firstly come along to the community information and feedback session if you're able to do that. And if not, please feel free to, um, to, to write to the team and we'll be considering your feedback as well as we, as we progress um, uh, in terms of the consultation. So I'm going to go to another couple of questions before I close out the session from tonight's session as well. Um, so let's have a look here. Lots of questions around sort of different operations and impacts over people's individual um, homes. Um, so again, I'd suggest um, to have a look at the brochure and then also to come along to one of the Hi everyone. Um, sorry, it sounds like we may have just lost our facilitator, but um, I will just throw over to David. Um, I know that there's been a few questions happening um, in the background just about um, how the department will consider feedback and, um, you know, how we'll also be collecting feedback during this period. And is it likely... Oh, but, but Deb, I think he's blinking at me and is back. I am back. Yes. Sorry. I, just, I think the, it dropped out, but good question. Um, oh, is David there? Must be having some issues with the stability of the internet, unfortunately, um, this evening. Um, so let's go to some other questions here. Oh, so, Matt, a question for you. Will there be new height restrictions imposed on Camden and Wilton airports for small aircraft? The proposals that we have uh, provided previously in the draft EIS haven't changed. So what we're discussing here tonight doesn't change the, uh, the current indicated uh, operations as they would affect those two airports. Um, the... Uh, yeah, so I can't I can't actually give you a specific example. Camden Airport is certainly uh, not impacted vertically. Um, the flight paths for Western Sydney remain laterally west of Camden's operation, um, and uh, its impact is. Um, I, I think I would direct you to the EIS information in the first instance to see our current proposed uh, flight path containment of where controlled airspace will be, and then also I do need to advise that. That uh, information in the draft EIS is still subject to detailed design as uh, air services moves forward, incrementing it. And in all in all cases, uh, we are working uh, to minimise the impact to the aviation community as much as we are to all the other communities involved. Thanks, Matt. Another question for you. What's the expected breakdown of um, passenger flights and freight aircraft when the airport opens? Uh, again, this one leads back to the uh, the schedule. I would direct you to look at the draft EIS for the current plan schedule of operations. But I, I do want to also just draw a, a discussion point here that um, 
there is a, a strong feeling in the community that freight aircraft will be noisier than other aircraft. That is not always the case. And I just want to make that that point. Um, a lot of freight these days is actually carried on board commercial aircraft as well. So your, um, your Qantas, uh, Virgin, uh, Emirates flight in and out of Western Sydney will be carrying freight. It's called belly freight. There will be some freight aircraft in there that are specifically freight operators, but many of those operate under the same noise constraints as other airports at the, um, oh, sorry, other aircraft operating uh, in Australia. And in terms of the breakdown, I will have to direct you to the draft EIS information and the later update in the final. Thanks, Matt. Um, another question here is something we hear often. If you could talk to Matt around fuel dumping, please. Does uh, fuel yeah. dumping happen? <laughs> well, fuel dumping is, it does occur. Um, but I, I guess this has been something which has been an ongoing feature of uh, all the consultation that we've had. And I do want to stress that fuel dumping is an un, uncommon experience. It happens rarely in operations, and when it does, there are procedures in place to minimize the impact to the environment. Um, to give you an example, the normal workhorses of the Australian Aviation domestic fleet are uh, 737s and A320 aircraft, so Boeing aircraft and Airbus aircraft, and they are not capable of fuel dumping, so it, it doesn't occur. Uh, modern Jet aircraft are also extremely fuel efficient. They operate high by bypass turbofan aircraft that use relatively small amounts of fuel at very high temperatures, which ensures complete combustion of the fuel. So there is very small amounts of uh, um, uh, anything coming out of the back of an aircraft um, that is not burned. And uh, when, it, when it does come to fuel dumping, which is something which can occur generally when a large aircraft on a long haul flight has an emergency and requires return to the airport, that aircraft generally will have to lose fuel before it can land. When that does occur, which is extremely infrequently, ATC are required to position that aircraft clear um, of uh, impacting the environment. That means the aircraft have to be taken up to a higher altitude and they are positioned generally in the Sydney Basin off the coast. And that fuel dumping occurs from an altitude at which it can be expected that all of the uh, kerosene falling from the aircraft will evaporate prior to reaching the ground. So it is a very low impact uh, event it, and it is a very uh, low likelihood event as well. Thanks very much. David, a couple of questions for you. Will KSA close completely in the future? Uh, certainly that's not part of any uh, government um, announced plan or, or anything that uh, the government is considering at this stage. Um, the Western Sydney is not designed to be a replacement for Kingswood Smith. It's designed to add capacity into the Sydney area. Terrific. Thank you. And another question for you, David. Could you just reiterate again, when is the EIS due for delivery, the final EIS? Look, the final EIS we are intending to provide to the Environment Minister and her department uh, probably at the beginning of the fourth quarter this year. So we, we hope in that um, uh, October, potentially November uh, timeframe, and then that kicks off those statutory time periods that I referred to earlier. Mm, thank you. Another question for you, Deb. Uh, I've lost Deb. I might go off. Why the, are there so many people around the West? In my... Sorry, Deb, do you mind just repeating yeah. that one? Sure, David. Just a question here. What are the restrictions? Why are there so many restrictions on developments for the noise affected areas around Western Sydney Airport? And that's not the case for Kingsford Smith Airport. Uh, I'm going to assume the question is referring to the New South Wales government legislation. So the state environment planning policy, Western Sydney Aerotropolis. Um, look, um, I will point out that that is state government policy. I'm, I'm no means responsible for or an expert uh, in that. Um, I would just say it around Kingswood Smith, it's obviously in a, in a very old and built up part of Sydney that this is probably not the same development opportunity there in terms of land that is not already residential and, and highly densely populated, whereas around Western Sydney Airport, um, there is uh, obviously much lower uh, residential density and, and um, in, in, um, in many cases, uh, a strong focus on developing new residential areas uh, as well. So these land planning uses do come into play in those situations. 
Um, look, but in, anything more than that, I really would have to defer to my state colleagues who are better placed to answer those sorts of questions. Thank you. And David, could you just talk to how you will be considering feedback that you hear during this next phase of consultation? Yeah, so look, um, we, we, we've been upfront that we, we can't accommodate a, a formal submission period this, this time around. We, we are um, endeavouring to receive people's feedback in person, so we'll certainly be re recording uh, that. For those who can join us at those uh, community information and feedback sessions, uh, your feedback is is very valued and recorded and logged uh, by us and, and certainly the Department of the Environment will expect us to reflect it. Um, also, um, we are saying that you please can write to us, so wsiflightpass uh, at infrastructure.gov.au. Um, there's no cutoff date. Um, we, we would never say to any citizen of this country or resident of this country that you don't write to government. Please always write to government. It's your government at the end of the day. Um, but I, I would ask that um, if you are going to write to us on these particular issues, please write to us as soon as possible to make sure that we can accommodate your feedback to the best possible uh, extent. Um, and, um, and and those are the two predominant ways for, for this time. So um, uh, I'd encourage you either or. And obviously we're taking um, a recording of tonight and we'll, we'll feed that in uh, as well. Thanks very much, David. And I recognise the time has gone 8.30. I just wanted to thank everybody who's attended tonight's session, in particular the panellists that have um, been part of tonight's session explaining the key proposals here and also to um, answering as many questions as we can. The team's been madly trying to type away lots of written questions and responses as well through through the session. Encourage you to visit Site there and got me back. Sorry, I'm dropping out. Sorry, dropping out again. Um, and that also has the, the dates and times of the community information and feedback sessions as well. And we look forward to seeing many of you at those sessions over the coming weeks. Thanks again for your time tonight. We'll make this recording available on the website as soon as we can. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening.